Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for the SIGRE webinar entitled Challenges and Future Optimization of Onshore and Offshore Wind Energy in Ireland and UK. My name is Melike Ayaz and I'm hosting today's session. I'm currently part of the event team of SIGRE UK and GM. I'm also a last year PhD student at the University of Manchester working on the control of low voltage microgrids with high penetration of distributed energy resources. Before we start, I would like to inform you that everyone is muted from the beginning of the session. I would highly encourage you to use the chat box for any questions to the speakers. After the, uh, their presentations, my colleagues will be collecting your questions through the chat box. The audio and presentations of the webinar will be recorded and published in our website after the event. Please keep an eye on the chat box because we will be sharing the links uh, through the chat box with you. So the webinar summary is shown uh, below. Uh, we are proud to tell that SIGRE Ireland and SIGRE UK Next Generation Networks are collaborating to host our first joint webinar to showcase the challenges and future optimization of off onshore and offshore wind generation in the UK and Ireland. Firstly, our UK NGN and Ireland NGN chairs will give brief introductions about SIGRE Young member activities. Icebreaker questions will be included in their presentations, raising interesting facts about wind energy and SIGRE committees. There will be three options in these questions, two truths and one lie. These quest questions will be shared through the polls and you will be able to see them on your screen about 30 seconds. I hope everyone will enjoy the challenging questions. Following the SIGRE talk, today we have four guest speakers, two speakers from SIGRE UK and GM, Professor Vladimir Terzia and Dr. Shinshin Zhao, and two speakers from SIGRE Ireland and GM. Dr. Peter Wall and Mr. Tuluk Miami. Each speaker will have around 10 minutes presentations. Then we will lead the five minutes question and answer session. Please feel free to drop your questions to the chat box. And please fo uh, follow the chat box for any announcements. Now, I would like to introduce the Ireland NGN chair. Jason Noctor to talk about SIGRE and GM activities in Ireland. We are listening to you, Jason. Uh, so thank you very much, Mel, uh, for the introduction. And uh, also- Let me firstly introduce oh, yeah. Jason, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Jason is an overhead line design engineer with the National Electricity Utility in Ireland, ESB. Prior to joining ESB, Jason studied civil engineering at University College Dublin and also completed a master's degree in engineering with business. Since beginning his career, Jason has worked on all aspects of OHL design, including foundations, steelwork, and conductors. Jason's main area of interest is in vegetation management for overhead lines where he has published papers and articles on the topic, and he's a member of SIGRE working group D273, Guide for Prevention of Vegetation Fires Caused by Overhead Line Systems. Yeah, now we are listening, Jason. So thank you very much, Mel, for the introduction. And also thank you for emceeing our event today. Um, so as per the next slide, my name is Jason Nocter, and I am the current chairperson of Seagrey Ireland NGN. And also for one day only, I have been assigned as the timekeeper for today's event. So if you hear anybody interrupting the speakers at any time, it's most likely to be me. So maybe don't pay me any attention. So um, for my first slide then, I would like to introduce my colleagues at Seagray Ireland NGN. So we are a 12 person committee and we're we're grouped together from four different organizations in Ireland. Um, so we have our, our professional photographs here. And 
I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank each and every one of them for all of their hard work and excellent contributions to the Seagre NGN committee. Um, they're a very hard working group of people and were instrumental in bringing all of our, all of our events so far to fruition. So I'll start then with some background about our organization. So Seagre Ireland NGN was formed in 2018. And since then, we have built a steady and active membership base. Um, maybe Mel, you could just move on to the next slide, please. Um, since then, we have built a steady and active membership base. Presently, we have 77 members as of 2020. And this actually represents an increase in 36% of membership from last year. However, our plan is to continue growing and we are actually aiming to reach 100 members to coincide with Seagray's 100th anniversary in 2021. So this will be quite a challenge for us. However, hopefully we'll be able to display all the benefits that um, people can obtain from joining Seagray today. Now we've also had many major milestones since our formation. And I'm going to talk you through some of these in our next slide. So firstly was our kickoff event in October 2018. Now, this was a joint event with a visiting delegation from a group in Japan. Um, the event ran with industry experts from both countries presenting on the theme of challenges of renewable integration in Ireland and Japan. So this was for our first event, this was a really fantastic event and it gave us a sense of the benefits of co-hosting events with other parties. It, allows, it allowed us to see how we can compare and contrast approaches um, from Ireland and other countries and it also provided an excellent networking opportunity for us. So on to the next slide then, roll on July 2019, which to date has been our largest event. Here we hosted the HVDC workshop and also a visit to the East-West Interconnector. This also represented our first co-hosted event with the UK NGN. And we had 10 members from the UK NGN making the trip over to Ireland. So this was a really, really interesting and informative event and it reinforced us the benefits of partnerships with other NGN groups. There was a lot of co-learning here and we also made some really fantastic um, networking opportunities with our colleagues in the UK NGN. Following this event, our next major event, our next major event and coincidentally it was our last up to now before we were gripped in the midst of COVID-19 was the Young Members Showcase and Flexibility Workshop, which we held in October of 2019. So this, was, this event was co-hosted with the UCD branch of ASHRAE and the committee in ASHRAE um, made a fabulous contribution with helping us organize this very successful event. For the Young Members Showcase, we selected 10 presentations from a total of 18 abstracts received. And two of these presentations were then chosen to go ahead and represent our NGN at the Paris session, which has now been postponed to 2021. So following these presentations, then we held a panel discussion with industry experts from Ireland on the topic of flexibility in the Irish system. This again was very well organized and very interactive and it was certainly something we enjoyed. Another item that we do, which is on the next slide, and it, this is a key part of the Seagrey Ireland's NGN efforts with connecting to our members, um, is our quarterly newsletter. Um, so we found that this is a very, very efficient way of connecting with our members. 
Our first newsletter was issued in December of 2019, and this provided a recap of all the activities and all the milestones of the year to date. We've since issued a newsletter in quarter one of 2020, with, and we have another newsletter in production for the end of this month. So our newsletters include topics such as sea gray news, um, information on upcoming events, and also provides an opportunity for young members to submit articles which details projects they're working on. We find this is a very beneficial aspect as it allows the young members and especially graduates or people doing PhDs to practice their, their technical writing and submit it to an audience. So on to the next slide then. So at this point, you've, prob you've probably heard me speak for long enough. So I think we're going to have a quick breather here. So on this slide, I have we have two facts and one lie. So Mel, if you would like to launch the poll and I would invite everybody to please select which they think the lie is. So I'm, I'm unsure Mel if the poll is coming up. Yes, I can see the poll. So whenever we have reached to uh, an important vote, I will I will uh, end the poll because now around fifty seven people have participated. Okay. So we encourage you to participate in the survey, please. Uh, we will have a couple of more seconds for your answer. So I'm sharing the results, Jason. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think people were, thankfully people were listening to me. Um, so the lie indeed is that we have over 150 members we don't. Um, we really wish we do. And I think we're very much so on track to reaching that target. However, we're currently at 77 members and we plan to grow this figure substantially over the next few years. So now I'm just going to introduce a brief background into wind energy in Ireland. So when, when we were doing some research into this, it's remarkable to think how far wind energy has advanced in Ireland since the first commercial wind farm was installed in Ireland in 1992. Now we have over 360 wind farms on the island of Ireland. 250 of these are located in the Republic and the island of Ireland actually has an installed capacity of over 5,000 megawatts. Um, our largest wind farm is located in Galway which is in the west of the country. And this has an installed capacity of 169 megawatts. So f further into our research then on the next slide, we noticed that recently there has been a very apparent shift change in the demand for fuel sources of electricity production in Ireland. So the historical reliance on traditional fuel types such as peat, gas and oil have actually been decreasing pretty significantly year on year. So contrast this then with more renewable sources of fuel, including wind, which has seen a pretty solid increase in demand, particularly over the last couple of years. So we have an interesting graphic then on the next slide. And what we see here is that wind energy uh, con contributes to about 30% or more of the overall fuel mix in Ireland. And it actually accounts for 85% of all renewable energy sources in Ireland. Overall, renewable energy sources account for about 36% of the fuel mixture that are, and this makes up presently the second largest fuel type. So on my final slide then, 
we will see that renewables and wind, hopefully, will eventually become the dominant fuel type. As this graph shows, the installed capacity of wind has been increasing year on year in Ireland. And as this trend continues, there will be a great emphasis on both offshore and onshore wind generation in Ireland. So just to check back in there, we have one more set of truths and lies for you. So the three statements are listed below and Mel, if you would like to launch the poll. So you should be able to see the poll now on your screen. And we have around one minute for the replies, please. Thank you, Mel. So we have 54 replies up to now from 103 participants in the group, in the session. Excellent. So we'll give maybe another 20 seconds for people yeah. to, to reply. It looks like a challenging question. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a, little, a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So we are coming to the end of our one minute time. So I'm ending the polling and you. you would be able to see the results on your screen. Excellent. So the results are a little bit tighter than the last time, but the majority of people got it right. Um, Ireland's first commercial onshore wind farm was commissioned in 1999, or sorry, into, in 1992, mm -hmm. as opposed to 1999 and there are 368 wind farms on the island of Ireland, but only about 250 in the Republic of Ireland. So Mel, I think that's all for me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jason, for the brief introduction to Ireland and GM. Now it's time for uh, Jingyi Wan to give us a talk about uh, Sigre UK and GM. So I would like to introduce Jingyi to you. Jingyi is a chartered engineer experienced in offshore electricity transmission, currently working as a consultant engineer for HV Cable Systems in Moss McDonald's Brighton office. Jingyi started the role as a chair of UK NGN, SIGRE UK NGN, from 2020, and she is current member of SIGRE Working Group B170. Recommendations for the use and the testing of optical fibers in submarine cables. We are listening to you, Jingyi. Hello. Um, let's move to the next slide. I will, before I go through the introduction for UK NGM member, um, I might just take um, this game about wind energy in the UK. So, um, which one of the following is a lie? There are above 10,000 operational uh, wind turbines. There are 1,200 onshore operational wind energy projects. And the operational capacity is approximately 16 million homes power equivalent. And um, I'll let Mel to decide when to stop the poll and please respond. So we will have like 10 more seconds. Okay. Yeah. Because we have like 65 votes for up to now. Sorry, yeah. 64. So yeah. can I encourage all the attendees to submit their answer? Just a quick guess will be fine. Yeah, we, we now have around 66 replies. So I'm ending yeah. the poll. 
Yeah. Um, so move to the next slide. I will reveal, reveal the answer. So the one I highlighted is actually a lie. So there are um, over 2,500 onshore operational projects. I hope this gives you a rough idea about how big is the wind energy market in UK, uh, as, which can also show on this graph. Next slide, please. And now, this is the team of uh, UK NGN. In total, we have 19 members, um, and I don't have time to go through all of them individually, but um, it's quite a good mix between uh, steering committees coming from the uh, um, industry and coming from the academia. Next slide, please. So 19 is actually quite a tricky number. So there's a um, whole little um, um, membership lead in this corner. So if you want to find more about our um, role and our organization and our email address, please go to our Seagrade UK website. Next slide, please. And I would like to give a quick go through of the history. Seagrade UK, UK NGN set up in 2007. It is the first uh, young member group and we celebrated our 10 years anniversary in 2017. And our current um, membership uh, is 217 and the female to male ratio is 20 to 80 percent. This is not surprising, but I do want to ask an open question. What can we do to improve this, this ratio? And I hope one of my following slides can help, to, um, can help to show what we have done to improve this ratio. And another fact is the student to in industry ratio is about 50-50. So it's a good combination. Um, uh, ne next slide, please. And this is just um, just to show all the previous events we have organized. I hope this show you that we have trying our best to organize as many events as possible to benefit our young members. Next slide, please. Now, just a few recent uh, events. I'm only allowed to talk a few because of the, te uh, the time limits. So move on to this first one. It is Nielsen Substation Visit. It is in collaboration with University of Streisfeld and it is a four day event. Uh, the, in the morning we had four technical presentation and in the afternoon we visited Nielsen Substation and we visit the Phoenix project. It is a hybrid solution combining synchronized condenser with st static condenser technology. And to one bonus po point, we also, we also had a big launch sponsored by Streisclyde. Next slide, please. This one is a career skill event. This is the first ever educational event we organized for kids. And our stand welcomed 1,500 primary and secondary students. Um, during the event, I noticed there are so many young, talented girls, um, say equal or even more than the boys. And during the event, we try our best to promote promote the interest for the power industry. And I hope this slide help to, um, to explain how we trying to solve the problem of 
the um, gender ratio. Next slide, please. And this one is a very uh, typical event, which is the Young Member Showcase. And 10 candidates were short shortlisted and the four winners nominate. This also followed by a tour in University Man uh, of Manchester, which also include a high voltage testing uh, lab tool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the reason why we host this Young Member Showcase uh, is actually because of this Paris session. So Paris session is the core of CIGRE. It's happened every two years. Um, for example, in 2018, uh, the event attracted more than 3,000 delegates and uh, 6,000 uh, exhibition visitors. Hundreds of papers are collaboratively debated and the Young Member Showcase is initiated by our UK committee to promote, uh, to provide young member opportunities to present their, um, their work in the panels. Um, at, and, what, what, and also free tickets will be offered. Next slide, please. Then I would like to just talk about some upcoming events. The first one is Chattership and Career in Insight webinar in collaboration with University of Manchester. And the second one in planning is a mentoring and techni technical webinar uh, in collaboration with a C-grade distinguished member. And we are scoping with international uh, NGN teams for collaborating webinars. So hello, all the international teams. Next one, please. And uh, due to the time limit, I don't have, uh, I couldn't um, go through detail of this mentoring scheme, but please do look forward to our upcoming webinar on this scheme. And if you have any question, please contact the membership uh, email address as you can see from the slide. Next slide, please. So now comes the exciting game. Uh, which one of the following is a lie? First one, CRA UK NGN was founded in 2008, has organized over 10 site visits, has over 200 members. Please respond, thanks. We have 50 responses so far. So we are encouraging people to also reply to this uh, challenging question. Yeah, please do provide your response. I think it's about uh, over 60%. So yeah, yeah. We, we are always this. saying at yeah, sixty four and sixty five. So yeah, probably the the rest yeah. of the reply. Okay, so let's end the polling and uh, please, Jingyi, introduce. Uh, yeah, I will reveal the answer. And actually, most of you get it right. So it is the lie is it wasn't founded in two thousand eight. It it was founded in two thousand seven. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thanks all for your attention. Thank you very much, Jingyi, for the brief introduction to SIGRE UK and GN. Now I would like to introduce Professor Vladimir Terzia, who will give his uh, speech entitled Smart Frequency Control in Power Systems with a High Penetration of Non-Synchronous Generation. Professor, now, if it's possible, can you please uh, switch to sharing your screen so that uh, in the meantime, I can uh, introduce you. Can you please uh, uh, put uh, me as a co-host? Then I will be able to screen. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Malika.
Professor Terzia is the EPSRC Chair Professor at the University of Manchester, UK. He is also Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Electrical Power and Energy Systems. IEEE Fellow, and he is also Alexander Wan Humboldt Fellow. He is the recipient of the National Friendship Award from China in 2019. His current research interests include smart grid applications, wide area monitoring, protection and control, multi energy systems, switch gear and transient processes, ICT, data analytics, and digital signal processing applications in power systems. We are listening to Professor Terzia. Thank you very much, much uh, Melike, for this kind uh, introduction. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me for such a nice and charming session in which I'm surrounding with so many young people. And this is, I think, one of key advantages, working as an academic. So uh, today I'd like to talk just very quickly about protection and control systems and wide area schemes. So this is something what has to do with application of modern technology. This is something what we also consider as smart grid. And my intention is to make a review of practical research projects, what means research projects, which we can describe projects with very high technology readiness level, what means projects which are very close to practical applications and practical problems. Well, in this, uh, on this, uh, let me just mention that I'm coming from the University of Manchester and uh, that I'm also editor-in-chief of uh, one of uh, journals. It is International Journal of Electrical Power and Energy Systems. And I'd be quite pleased uh, to receiving your paper submissions. Well, in this slide, it is a very general slide in which on the left side, you can see that we have the classical approaches for power generation you can see hydropower plant, you can see thermal power plant or nuclear power plant. These are classical ways and they're key components, key enablers of system, electrical power system to operate. We generate electrical power. However, we have limited resources, limited resources of primary energy, which was given to us through activities of sun and other activities for which we needed millions and millions of years. And in the middle, you can see another option, option of utilizing renewable energy sources like wind farms, uh, PV, solar, and also an important enabler of all activities. This is uh, battery storage. However, lithium is also limited from its quantity, but the important thing is a high density of energy in electrical battery storage, which is important for a number of smart grid applications. On the right side, you can see elements which have to do with transmission network, which is equally important. No transmission network, no connection between generators and customers. On the top right slide, you can see a typical high voltage AC transmission line. In the middle, you see a typical high voltage open air substation in which you have bus bars, instrument uh, transformers, you have uh, circuit breakers, uh, isolators, and everything that has to be properly controlled. So on the slide, on the right side down, you see a typical example of high voltage DC transmission line. So we are living today in a mixed AC DC transmission system. This is bringing opportunities, but also challenges from the perspective of its optimal utilization. So we have a generation Look at this upper slide on the left side. Maybe these slides are very basic. They are indeed. But let me just make a recapitulation. We have generation, transmission, and distribution. We have also connection to electricity trains. But the idea is to deliver electrical energy to customers in an optimal manner, also protecting the system from different types of events 
which could also lead to fire, as you can see on the right side. And at this stage, let me just point out that we are dealing with unbelievable generation of electrical energy. So the annual electricity generation in China in 2015, you can see the trend, can be measured in trillion of kilowatts. So we are talking about unbelievable energy produced by generators transmitted and utilized. The challenge is that this whole process, generation, transmission, and distribution, utilization, must happen instantaneously, having a balance between generated and consumed active and reactive powers. In this context, we have to control such a massive system. And then we have a control room. It is the slide uh, from National Grid in which we control the system operation. In this context, we need to be aware about system state. We are using state estimators, SCADA system, supervisory control and data acquisition. And we know the system topology. We know the system state. And then we are in a position to anticipate what will happen an hour ahead or 15 minutes ahead. For this purpose, very serious uh, um, applications uh, and software are run in real time in electrical power system. Moving forward to particular targets, which I'd like to address today, it's uh, about really a challenge to meet, let me describe which challenge, to meet a demand and a need for integration of renewable energy sources and to lead the system to an optimal operation. Let me just simplify that because I have really a limited time. And at the same time, to be capable of uh, fault identification, location, isolation, and rectification. We'd like also to be capable to monitor what is happening in the system in an optimal manner using top technology and communication and infrastructure. So I'd like to talk about Wiser project. In this context, I'm very happy to mention that uh, I hope uh, that one uh, attendees is uh, my former peer degree student Papia, Dr. Papia Dottori, and also the speaker, uh, my respected also peer degree student and postdoc, uh, Dr. Peter Wall. They were involved in this complex and important project, which was enabled for the next project activity, it is Smart Frequency Control, it is EFCC project led by National Grid. The pre previous one, Wiser, has been led by Scottish Power. And last but not least, I'll say a few words about the general concept of wide area monitoring, protection, and control. So this is the slide which is probably known to you, but I'd like just to point out that we have uh, UK and GB system, which is one uh, synchronous zone, another is Nordal and UCT. And these uh, zones, which are itself controlled on itself, having their own control systems, they are connected using uh, high voltage transmission lines, and they are creating a massive interconnection. You have also, if you go a little bit to the west, you have back-to-back -back, back connection to Russian system, integrated power system. And if you move forward, I'm not quite 100% sure, but there is, yes, also connection to China in, uh, in, in, in connection between west of Russia and Inner Mongolia, I think. I know that we also have a listener from Inner Mongolia now. Greetings to this my former student, now PhD student in Hong Kong. Well, such a massive infrastructure is expensive. And as I'm informed, the investment into GB system is larger than the value of the existing asset. So you see what is our responsibility, particular responsibility of you young CIGRE members. So a list of massive projects which I led in the past, Visor, 8 million pounds, EFCC, frequency control, fitness, digital substation. The principal investigator was Dr. Hayu Li. I was the co-investigator. I was very busy with other things. Then an interesting project for National Grid Humber Zone project, uh, Horizon 2020 Migrate project, and Accept project. For these last two projects, also um, 
Dr. Peter Wall was responsible from the perspective of project proposal. We worked very hard together in my office, often also late by night, and we were successful together with our partners. So let me give you words about the uh, <clears throat> Visor project and challenges related to Visor project. The idea was to improve situational awareness in the whole GB system. Uh, we have uh, shuttle, we have Scottish power, we have national grid. And in all these parts of the system, uh, we installed uh, phaser measurement units and we have, you can see the existing green uh, components, they are metering devices, PMUs, the existing, and also you have newly planned PMUs. And furthermore, we have also these components, you can see these, magenta, and they are way for monitoring units. They have special features to be capable of monitoring of so-called subsynchronous uh, oscillations in the system. So let me make an analogy. Having such a system and all these metering devices which are time synchronized using, for example, GPS as a timing source, so it is the traditional and well-known to all of us, but otherwise we have also Galileo system for Europe, we have GLONASS in Russia, you have Baidu in China. What means time synchronization system, which is capable of sending information of time. By synchronizing these devices, we can not only measure um, magnitude of voltage, for example, but also angle. So we move to measurement of synchrophasers, voltage or current. So all this information is sent to the central point or set different set of central points in the system using communication infrastructure. So I'm pointing out the importance of communication infrastructure of uh, uh, the communication protocols used for this purpose and communication media. Uh, in this hierarchy, we have phaser measurement units. After that, we have data center and data hub, like PMUs, data concentrator, super data concentrator. Super data concentrator or data hub is installed now in uh, Wokingham in a control center of National Grid. So, in this project, we addressed a number of issues, but one of issues was monitoring of subsynchronous resonance, particularly uh, one problem which could cause uh, massive, um, massive problems with the uh, uh, generators and the damages on, of generators. And we have also addressed the issues of uh, uh, state estimation and uh, moving to so-called hybrid state estimation uh, approach. The next- uh, Excuse me, Professor, we're approaching our, our 10 minute time limit. Yes, let me then, I, I'll very quickly move to, to, the, to the end because I obviously haven't planned very well everything that. So- uh, Thank you. This is a, yes, this is a project in which we had uh, an approach for fast frequency control and Instead of going very deep into these details, I will just go and switch to this uh, link in which I would like to show you. Now I will stop sharing this uh, um, one and to go to another screen. Let me go to this screen. Uh, I hope that you see this screen. So in this screen, you can see an approach in which we are using phase of measurement units. This area is area near uh, it is a Humber, it is a city hall and York, and we monitor capacity which could be transferred over one specific transmission corridor. This is an application which runs in real time in National Grid and can be used as decision supporting tool. And one of particular aspects addressed in this uh, application is dynamic rating, dynamic thermal line rating. Well, now let me just move to back to the uh, previous uh, slide uh, to finish my presentation. Um, and uh, let me find it. Yes, this is the one in which I will just make a conclusion by, uh, let me see, it's not easy to move so quickly. Yes, by concluding that 
we have now a power system with different dynamic properties and different needs, needs for flexibility, resilience, not only security and stability. And in a single sentence, I'd like to say that using modern technology, modern sensors and communication infrastructure from one hand, and from another hand, applications, we are moving to the world of smart, smart grid and optimal utilization of the system. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for this very nice uh, presentation. Now I would like to ask my colleague Bill to collect the questions from the audience and to ask to Professor Terzia. Hi, Professor Erdings. Um, we just have the one question, uh, and it is, do you know if there are issues with the interconnector protection when differing protection is used on either side of the interconnector? as there is different protection used for different countries? Well, this is a very broad topic. We are talking about protection of uh, high voltage DC transmission lines. In this, uh, for this purpose, the question is, what is the topology? Is it a point-to-point -point interconnector or it is, a, uh, uh, is it a voltage source converter based uh, technology in which we have a meshed network, which is then created a huge problem, what means problem also of having a, a power electronics based circuit breaker, uh, which should be activated by protection. And I can only say that uh, if we use a, a concept of differential protection, it is an easier concept. We are also using concepts of traveling based protection. But as a matter of fact, we have to make sure that uh, uh, intelligent electronic devices used from both sides, if they are from different manufacturers, from different countries, they have to satisfy interoperability requirement, uh, which is necessary for uh, efficient uh, and secure and reliable operation of protective devices. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks a million. I think that's all we have time for on that one. I think we might move on. Thanks, Thanks a million. Thanks, Bill, for such an important question. It's a protection, protection of HVDC transmission lines, very, very important topic. Thank you very much for Professor Terzia for giving this insightful presentation to us. Now our next speaker is Dr. Sure. Peter Wall. And Dr. Peter Wall is also sharing his screen at the moment. He is a Currently a senior innovation engineering at AirGrid, he was awarded his PhD in University of Manchester, investigating the online prediction of post-disturbance frequency behavior of a power system. He was also a member of the project delivery team for Visor, uh, which was a network innovation competition project led by SP Energy Network in collaboration with National Grid SSE University of Manchester and GE. Visor created the first wide area monitoring system that captured, visualized, and analyzed real time synchron phasers and other data from all three transmission owner networks in Great Britain. Now we are listening to Dr. Peter Wall. Hi. Uh, can everyone hear me there? Yes. Excellent. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, as you said, Peter Wall. I'm currently a senior innovation engineer at AirGrid where I work on primarily the DS3 studies and EU SysFlex, the project name you can see in front of yourself. Now, as you may know, AirGrid, we're the system operator in Ireland, and we operate with up to 65% of generation from wind at any time, and we operate an isolated system with peak demand of below 7 gigawatts. So it's a relatively small system. There's no AC interconnection to the UK or Europe, and that means that it's a system that's really at the forefront of moving to a high renewable future. And along with our other stakeholders, that's something we've had to work very hard towards achieving. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our work on the EU SysFlex project, which is a European Union funded Horizon 2020 project tasked with exploring the technical issues and market solutions for 2030 operation of the European system at high renewables. So really my objectives for this short talk today would be to introduce the EU SysFlex so you get familiarity with what the project is, give you a flavor of how utilities perform dynamic studies at scale, 
and then share a quick sampling of the results from EU Sysflex. So this is a quick outline of EU Sysflex. It's a major project, and as you can probably see in all the different work packages, it's quite large, complex. We have utilities and researchers from across Europe involved in this project working together. And it's really modeled around this wheel concept where today I'm talking about that green slice, which is scarcity identification, which is using technical studies to identify the scarcities in 2030. Examples being, say, reduced inertia, reduced short circuit strength, or sort of controller interactions. And then working around that wheel, we're looking at developing market and regulatory based structures and solutions, then demonstrating live pilot projects, the technology that can deliver those solutions through those markets and regulations to fix those technical scarcities. And then looking at the tools that the operators will need to really deploy that. So task 2.4, which is the task I'm talking about today is really at the heart of a lot of this. It's the technical work that is focused on identifying those scarcities. So we've reviewed what we're looking for, we've understood the modeling, and then we'll find those scarcities and feed into the other, those other work packages. As you can see here, whilst today, I'm really just talking about a small subset of the air grid work. We have studies from the Nordic systems done by BTT, studies performed by EDF and PSE for the whole continental European system. And of course, the studies by Egrid and Sony for Ireland and Northern Ireland. And these cover the full range. Today, I'm going to just touch on what we call dynamic voltage control. But we've been looking at static voltage control, congestion, restoration, frequency, the whole range of possible issues that you hear people talk about on this future system. As I've touched on, this is really a quick sort of helicopter view of 2.4. There's a full report on the website and there's a video of a webinar we did covering all of these results with all of the partners. So if you're interested in what Sysflex has been doing, then I really encourage you to get onto those links and look at the reports from this task and other tasks and hear the other utilities talk about their work as well. So dynamic voltage control is our scarcity for today. And these studies we performed to give you a quick highlight of how we go about this. We used a full RMS dynamic model of the system. That's a couple of thousand buses. And for 2030, that's over a thousand generators are modeled differently. We use what's called a second generation WEC model for the wind and the PV and their RMS models again. And then we use the detailed synchronous machine models that are in the control room models today. So that's sort of a quick overview of our dynamic model. Then we, determine the unit commitment and dispatch of those models. So the wind level, the demand level, which generators are on based on the uh, results of a unit commitment uh, production cost model that we solve in Plexus. And we solve that for a 2030 scenario. I think I won't have time to go through it in detail today, but what we call scenario planning is a really important aspect of planning for this future. The scenarios are different. I think of them as flavors of the future. Do you have large wind farms that are centralized or do you have lots of distributed renewables? And you'll find it fascinating how those different scenarios will generate different results. So, as I mentioned, we use this production cost model and we generated a set of dispatches for a full year. Each of those gray dots you see on the slide is one hour of a year, scattered with SNSP or renewable penetration on the Z axis, inertia on the X and the number of large units on the Y. And I think the big takeaway from this for me is always the sheer range of future operation you can see. I've highlighted type one and type two there in blue and green. Type one are your heavy classical hours where you've got high inertia. It's very similar to what we'd have today and very low renew renewables. While type two, you've got 80 to 90% penetration. You've got very low inertia and no what we call large sets. So your CCGTs aren't on the system. You've just got sort of peak units maybe run on the river hydro and peakers. So they're two completely different versions of the future. And the key takeaway for me from that is the variation we have and that some days in the future in 2030, you'll have a power system that looks just like today's. Other days you'll have a power system that looks nothing like today's. But any solution we develop has to work for both of those futures equally and fairly for participants. Otherwise you won't get this future. And this really does drive up complexity. It's also what motivates us to use these production cost models to generate the 8760 and study the future. Because the classical planning approach would take max demand, min demand, and move on. 
But you have the question now is max and min your real worst cases. You have versions of max demand. Imagine you could have max demand served by synchronous or max demand served primarily by wind. They're very different cases and you, have that, you need to really assess the future to understand are there new worst cases emerging. So, our first, the scarce thing I want to talk about today was dynamic voltage control. And when you perform a study of this nature, you really have to use measures of what am I trying to understand, have a rigid way of defining, is there a problem, is there not a problem, measuring that. The metrics we used for this study were unique violations and early recovery, where unique violations just counts the number of buses that go below 0.5 per unit after a fault. So as you can see in those time domain examples, we run the model, put a three-phase fault on a bus, and then we just count the buses that go below that dashed line. We then, then calculate the percentage of buses which recovered during the fault. And the concept of this was to get a... The concept of that was to get a feel for how far the fault spreads and how springy the system is during the fault. So, a couple of box plots here. We ran about 300 contingencies for each snapshot and we studied a selection of points from across that gray space I showed. The left you have the blue and the green are again type one and type two. So your low penetration and your high penetration. And you can see that in terms of unique violations at low penetration, there's really no problem. But at high penetration, there's a big problem. About three quarters of the system, in this case, will see it less than 0.5 per unit when the fault comes on which means any fault is propagating really far and wide across the system, which isn't something that we see today. However, we also see, as I've mentioned, that blue cloud, that those intermediate cases sometimes have problems and sometimes don't have problems. So renewable penetration doesn't tell the whole story. I think that's something you have to really think about when looking at these future cases. Just looking at raw renewable penetration won't tell you the full story. You have to understand what's left of the synchronous, where it is, and what fills up that. Say if you have 70% pin of penetration, what makes up 30? If it's two large units, you're gonna have very different behavior than dozens of small units. So that's something to bear in mind when you get presented with an SNSP number, what's really behind that. So then moving on to the early recovery. So this is how much of that 0.5 per units would spring back. And as you can see, it's a similar story you have more early recovery as SS, S and SP increases. So what that really looks like is these two waveforms. Uh, sorry, Peter, we're just yep. approaching our time limits. Excellent, I'm almost done, so we should be fine. Um, Great. So you have the blue waveform, the green. The green is your classic response, which if you've run a fault in today's RMS studies for a normal system, you'll be familiar with that. The green's a little new and different, and that's the real impact of wind on these studies. You have that big wide ranging drop initially, and then that springy recovery and that really worrying oscillation after the fault clears. So what this tells us is we move to high renewables, we'll have a weaker system because of low system strength, but lots of fast responding reactive sources that will push the system around. And you have to question, would the system really survive those swings? And then go to the next stage of your study, which is when you start studying how should the control of those converters be set up? Because we used a very standard control setup just to do the first wave. Is that deep drop a modeling artifact or is it a real piece of behavior you have to worry about? And just go to that next step. Um, so in conclusion, I think really what we're looking at is from that very helicopter view, there is a real scarcity of dynamic voltage control. I've quickly shown you that there. The 2.4 results show other scarcities across static voltage, congestion, angle and frequency. And there are very real problems emerging that we can study with today's tools. There's also, a lot of work in the next stage of these studies where we have to look at new tools that can study those new problems. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the difference between RMS and EMT and the fact that a more complex model will give you more accurate and realistic results, but it will compress your ability to quickly do studies. These studies took a lot of time to do because you've got the 8760, the full system model and all of those issues. And then when you go to EMT, you have hundreds of parameters, not dozens. And what I just touch on is with a basic model, you can get useful results to answer your questions as long as you remember the limitations and build on them rather than seeing them as an end point. Similar studies have been performed all around the world by TSOs as they move towards the future. And these studies are essential. We've got to be planning today to ensure that we have the incentives and structures in place for tomorrow. 
because big equipment that you need to build like wind farms, they have lead times. So if we aren't sending good signals as soon as possible, we won't get the equipment we need. And that's gonna have real financial and environmental impacts because we'll block off our own low carbon future through poor planning effectively. CISFLEX is really uh, grid, another European TSO's first cut at these studies to see where the problems are, how we can study them, and what's the next step for studying them better as we move forward. So I'd like to thank you for your time and hope you took something from, from this and I'll try and answer questions as they come in. Thank you all. Peter, thank you very much for sharing this very interesting presentation with us. And I would ask Bill to uh, lead our questions, please. Yep, perfect. Um, thanks William, for that, Peter. Uh, just a few questions come in here. Um, one from Professor uh, Terzija. Uh, do you have developed approaches for fast detection or monitoring of dynamic voltage instability, short-term voltage instability? We primarily at the moment for that sort of detecting instability, we use online security assessment, which is a tool we call WSAT, which is the wind security assessment tool. Uh, we use that sort of real-time dynamic simulation to assess the system for contingencies to see if there would be problems. We, to my knowledge, don't have any sort of dedicated dynamic collapse SIPs. We just have what you'd expect the standard relays in place. We don't have a special real-time monitoring system, but we heavily lean on dynamic security assessment okay. to preempt those issues. Thank you very much. Um... We'll just continue until Jason stops us here. So um, there's just another one come in here. It says, uh, hi, Peter. Thank you very much for the presentation. What are the key next steps for modeling in AirGrid's future studies? I think for me, the two key next steps would be, as I mentioned, those converter models, adding an extra level of detail in them with PLLs so we can confirm that those voltage swings would cause instability rather than just strongly suspect. Secondly, it would be looking at different default tuning options because currently as a utility we don't tune controllers but with such a weak grid we need to think about how do you get a control setup in the converter that works for that type one heavy system and the type two light system that's a real challenge and we're probably not the best place people to answer it so that's going to be some collaborative work finally would be load models we use a load model that looks a lot like a load model you'd have seen in the 80s and if you think how different a household is and demand types are across that time range there needs to be some real work in updating our demand models both in dynamics the distribution of demand and how we sort of update those as time you know, the, there's the day that time of day and the date changes to make sure that we're getting demand right because it's half the system dynamics really there's a big focus on generation but you've yeah. got to get demand right especially with the emergence of demand side management if we want flexible demand we've got to model it right yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and then also on that is, um, would significant battery installations help reduce the waveform wobbles occurring after the fault to damp out the oscillations? Um, yes and no, and maybe. It's a terrible answer to that. But if you have those batteries in, if you have the controllers set up properly, then they could do. If you have them set up incorrectly, they'll join in and make it worse. We have a lot of battery models in that model. And it's very much how you get them tuned and how you have the controls set up. If you get it wrong, they'll make it worse. If you get it better than right, it'll make it better. That's again, assuming they stay in and that this weakness of the system doesn't allow them to trip. The controls can be sensitive to that weak grid where they basically feed back into themselves. In terms of batteries, I would point again to the report and encourage people to look at it in more detail. We had some great results on the impact of batteries on frequency scarcities. Mm. and how a very interesting result in that our more ambitious renewable scenario with higher penetrations has better frequency security than our less ambitious scenario because of the rollout of these new technologies mitigating the problems. So again, I'd point to that Perfect. and have a look over there. Yeah, great answer. Thank you. Um, and then I think just one final question. Um, how much useful and in what terms positive sequence or MS studies can be adequate to assess weak system conditions? Should they be validated straight with EMT studies? I think RMS simulations are very useful. Even when you're looking at the weak grid future, they're a good way of, we, have, we understand them well, we have a lot of experience with them and we can identify the scale of problem. We are definitely now moving to a world where 
we're going to be needing to do some sort of EMT planning study, which would be very new to everyone involved, because as the question is alluding to, there are mechanisms that the RMS model will not be able to capture. And we need to be thinking about controller interactions at the EMT level and that weak grid model that the EMT can really capture where RMS can only sort of hint to. I think you really need to be cautious with EMT studies because the models, as I mentioned in my speak talk, they are far more complicated. They're technology and manufacturer specific. So getting them set up is much harder. So you have hundreds of parameters, not dozens, and it's hard enough to get a thousand RMS generic models set up, never mind hypothetical future EMT models. But we need to start pushing into that space to make sure there aren't hidden problems that RMS can't show us. And then we need to compare the two. And I feel as long as you're using EMT to be aware of the gaps in your RMS, RMS can still play a key role, but we do need to push into that EMT study world more. Perfect. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for. So I'll pass it back to Malik. Thanks, Thank William you. Peter. No, I was just on the show there. Thank you. Thank you very much for both Professor Terzi and Peter Wall uh, for giving us very insightful presentations. And now I would like to introduce you our third speaker, Tululuk Mayomi, to give his talk about the opportunities of dynamic line rating for overcoming curtailment challenges. Mr. Tuluk Mayomi joined ESP EMP in September 2019 as an overhead line design standards engineer. He was awarded his bachelor's degree from University of Pittsburgh Johnstown, Johnstown, Johnstown then went on to complete his master's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Limerick. We are listening to you, Tuluk. Uh, sure. Hi, hi now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will, we will be talking about uh, dynamic line rating. Uh, so I'm going to, first of all, introduce the project. Uh, I'm going to introduce the concept of dynamic line rating. Then I'll talk about uh, various approaches to dynamic line rating, um, both the, um, through the use of weather weather data and the use of sensors. Then I'll present two case studies that have been conducted in the UK. And then uh, I think we have, we, will, we should hopefully have time for questions. All right, so in front of me, uh, and I hope in front of your screens as well, is the Galway Wind Park uh, in Ireland. It's 169 megawatts and it was commissioned, I think in 2016. It's the biggest wind farm in Ireland uh, as of today. And uh, I think it produces enough power to uh, power, I think, approximately 400,000 homes in Ireland. However, uh, as you, wind farms such as this all over Ireland uh, um, are currently um, underutilized. That's because uh, approximately 7% of all the electricity that was generated in wind farms such as this across Ireland um, was not supplied to the final consumer due to um, several factors, which we will talk about um, uh, later on in this presentation. Uh, this problem is not unique to uh, Irish wind farms, uh, and it's also um, it's also um, a challenge in the UK as well. For example, uh, in 2017, if you look at the total cost of um, curtailment uh, in Ireland and the UK, it was approximately 135 million euros. So, that's uh, in the grand scheme of things, might not seem like a massive amount of money, but I just wanted to put a couple of slides just to illustrate uh, what you could get with 135 million euros. You could get an F-35 fighter jet, you could get Hurricane on, on, on his good day. Or you could or just imagine how many uh, offshore wind farms you could, you could build with that uh, amount of money. So it's, it is a problem, not only due to the monetary value, but also because it seems to be an increasing problem. So um, as the amount of wind farms or wind energy is integrated into the grid, there seems to be an increase in the curtailment of um, of um, wind energy and the losses seem to increase um, yearly. So what's at the um, causes of curtailment? Well, there are several causes of, co of curtailment. It's just, there's no one particular cause. Um, some of the causes include um, lack of net network infrastructure. So in some particular places, for example, there might not be, um, uh, there might not be enough interconnectors or 
or the other network issues such as hot joints, such as um, or such as areas of sheltering uh, along the, um, the line. Another um, big issue is just the is the inaccuracies in forecasting demand. So sometimes the the, um, the demand for power is overestimated, and so during such um, during such periods. Um, if the demand of electricity is um, overestimated, then the system operator will tell um, power plants such as wind farms to either reduce their their um, production or to uh, cut off supply. And that is basically what curtailment is. Curtailment is just curtailment is a situation which arises when um, a wind farm that is generating um, let's say x amount of energy does not supply. 100% of that um, energy due to either network limitations, um, lack of uh, a lack of a lack of demand, or issues like that. So, uh, dynamic line rating um, is a potential solution to the to the to the problem of um, um, curtailment. And so, I'd like to introduce dynamic line rating to you. Uh, as you can see in in, in front of me, uh, when um, overhead lines are designed. They're usually designed with a, with ground clearances in mind, and these gr ground clearances are legal requirements um, that are set set forth to ensure the safety of the public. Uh, Alice and Bob, in this example, um, and so the ground clearance um, basically is the distance from the minimum um, from the minimum point of, of the conductor to the ground, and in deciding in determining the ground clearances, there are several um, environmental factors that are that are considered. And these factors are usually um, are usually um, very conservative in um, usually to ensure that um, the the clearances are never exceeded. So we usually um, assume very um, very high temperatures, for example, very low wind speeds, and uh, the maximum amount of solar radiation for approximately a thousand watts per meter squared, usually. However, what dynamic line rating and this is the the ingenuity of it um, seeks to do is to monitor the actual weather conditions or, or line conditions uh, alongside the entire line. And by doing this, we can, we can figure out what, um, if we know what the actual weather conditions along the line is, we can determine, um, we can determine the amount of current that, that can be passed through the line without violating the ground clearance limitations. And as you can see in, in the um, graph to the left of Alice and Bob, uh, a typical line will have a static limit. Uh, which would be um, the maximum amount of uh, current that could pass through the line based on the, um, the ground class limitations. So you could have um, a limit of 1,000 amps, uh, which is the case in the, in the image in front of you. However, using dynamic line rating, if we could monitor the actual conditions in line, we, and we don't have to follow the conservative estimates, uh, which is usually employed in the design stage, then the the capacity of the line could be increased. As you can see in, in the graph in front of you, there's a 50% increase during certain um, periods and up to 100% increase uh, if you look at the purple line, which is the real time capacity. So there are several approaches to dynamic line rating. Uh, so there are several ways that it can be carried out. One approach is involves the use of the weather-based uh, model. Now the weather-based model, um, in order to employ the weather-based model, what operators do or what uh, uh, designers do is that you obtain uh, weather data from wind farms, either in substations or in weather mass close close to the, to the line, and the data is is now is then extrapolated to um, to um, along the length of the line. And so, if we know the actual weather conditions along the, along the line, we can um, use um, uh, several standards. For example, the Seagrey two hundred seven standard to determine. Um, the maximum amount of currents that can be passed through the line without violating the ground clearance limitations. For example, uh, as you can see in, in, in front of me, uh, there are several factors that, 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 that could be considered, considered to optimize the amount of currents in the line. One of such factors is the wind speed. Uh, we can also look at the wind direction, the air temperature, solar heating. But I just want to point out, for example, that um, as you can see in front of me, you can uh, the, if you optimize the wind speed, you can improve the um, capacity of line for about up to 260 percent. But this is usually not the case because in order to do that, you have to get wind speeds of about 10 meters per second. And usually at the height of overhead lines, uh, the wind speed is usually not that high. So, but you, but you could get up to 50 percent uh, increase in the capacity of, of the line. However, um, so using weather-based um, uh, monitors for dynamic line rating is very offers very ad uh, various advantages such as it's very cheap and it's very easy to install. However, there are several certain 
um, disadvantages. For example, even though um, we would love to optimize the, the, the wind speed along the length of line, um, uh, determining what the actual um, um, conditions of, for the wind along the length of the line is very difficult because extra, uh, extrapolating um, a global, the global data over local terrain is harder because the, the speed of the wind locally is usually a function of the topography of the line. So in order to do that, you really have to maybe perform like uh, CFD simulations and you generate, it's, it's more data in intensive to, to, to do that. So what's usually optimized uh, is the air temperature. And, uh, but you don't get massive increases in the, in, in the, in, um, by using air temperature. So the other way of um, conducting dynamic line rating, um, which is which uh, will for the for for the for the purpose of this presentation, we'll call the real, real time rating, involves the use of sensors. So sensors um, are placed on the line, and uh, they're used to measure like uh, the temperature of the line, the size of the line, or the output. Or the, or the, or the Thank you. Along the line, and uh, using this uh, using this information, we could uh, <laughs> we could determine the, the the what the weather conditions actually are on the line because we have the the Seagrid standards, or and we can uh, we can we can fall back to our calculations. Uh, there are several advantages of using uh, actual sensors. For example, um, it usually it usually provides a more accurate um, picture of the conditions along the line, uh, and uh, it's usually better um, for producing forecasts um, for 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 what the conditions along the line will be in the future. However. Um, uh, sensors are usually more expensive to install um, to to use, and uh, they could be harder to install um, than using the weather-based scenario. So I just want to. Uh, um, sorry, Tolu, you have about one minute left. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to touch uh, touch on two case studies. Uh, one was conducted by Central Networks, uh, and one was con con um, um, conducted by NIE. In the in the um, case study produced by Central Networks, as you can see in in the graph to my left. There was they were able to obtain uh, up to a 50% increase in the opacity of the line. In fact, greater increases in the opacity of the line could have been obtained, but uh, there were practical um, limitations due to other components such as circuit breakers, uh, uh, which 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 limited the 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 uh, amount of increase that, that they could get. The other um, um, case study, which was conducted by NIE, was done to to prevent an overload. Um, of, uh, of the Omar to Donaga to Dungannon 110 kV line, and in this um, case, uh, a relay um, was was placed at at uh, a 30 megawatt wind farm, and because the wind farm was the critical factor in, in in deciding whether or not the line was going to be overloaded, and so the data from the dynamic line rating sensors was fed into the was fed to the relays, and using an algorithm, they were able to decide whether or not. Um, under certain scenarios, they, they could cut off the, the connection between the farm and, and, and the line. So you can see that um, dynamic line rating can, can be used for several um, different purposes, both for increasing the opacity of the line or for also um, 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 pro protecting the lines and preventing overloads and um, other cases such as this. So just to um, provide you a quick summary, um, curtailment uh, represent a, a uh, drain on um, and a challenge for the for, optimi for optimizing um, wind energy um, in both in Ireland and UK. However, uh, dynamic line rating is uh, potential is potentially um, uh, one of the means of addressing this issue. Um, dynamic line rating is done through the use of both weather we through the use of weather data and sensors placed along the length of the line. And uh, as you saw in the case study, dynamic line rating offers up to a fifty percent increase in the opacity of the line. And uh, I think at the end, we're, we're all huge fans of, of this technology. Right. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, right, how are you? I'll, uh, yeah, sorry, there's a few questions coming in here. Um, sorry, a few of them came in just directly. So here's the first question. Um, is dynamic line rating a feasible alternative to constructing new lines or uprating lines? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so, Abdul. Uh, so um, I think according to the to Egrid's policy uh, for Ireland, I'm just using if I use Ireland as, as a as a case study, uh, dynamic line rating does not offer isn't an alternative to constructing uh, new power lines. Um, that's because uh, although you can get dramatic increases in the opacity of lines, they are usually other they are usually uh, limitations posed by other components of, of along the line, as you saw in the case study. 
Uh, but dynamic line rating does offer um, usually a short time, a short term um, increase in the in the opacity of the line. So let's say um, in cases where um, they, there are maybe new wind farms that have to be integrated to, to, um, along the line, and you don't, there is an issue with just pre, um, building new um, um, connectors. Uh, dynamic line rating offers like a short term solution, while um, before um, more long term. Um, um, processes or long-term um, long-term technologies are, are implemented. Perfect, thank you. So a bit of a quick fix, yeah, perfect. Um, there's another question just coming in here now. Um, hi Tolu, do you envisage this dynamic control being completely automated in the future to feed directly into EMS systems? Also, is there an estimated cost overall for installation of the sensors per yeah, load? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll first, I think the cost of dynamic line rating has uh, presently it's estimated to be about a million, a million per hundred kilometers. So uh, uh, that might seem like a lot, but usually um, it usually um, offers up significant savings over the the, the life cycle. And usually, sometimes uh, um, grid operators might buy maybe a hundred or maybe 20, however um, many of, of, the, of these sensors, and then you could place them in, in different lines as and when needed. Um, as to the question of automation, um, uh, I, I, will, will it be um, fully automated in the future? Um, there, there are some papers, uh, there, there are some, um, some case studies where um, the, the data, um, they try to optimize the use of dynamic line, line ratings through the use of um, other pieces of technology like machine learning, but um, I think that is that might, might that might that is plausible um, as to the future evolution of the, of the technology. Okay, thanks a million. Um, good answer. Um, so there's a couple of questions come in here. Uh, what are some of the limitations of the technology? So um, some of the limitations of dynamic line like uh, like uh, I said before, is probably that uh, one. It's not. Um, it's not um, a silver bullet. So dynamic line rating doesn't isn't the isn't and uh, doesn't solve all your problems. So you just um, placing sensors in the line it does not um, remove the need to for, for for constructing new lines, for example. And then um, depending on the technology, for example, the weather based um, dynamic line uh, using we um, weather data, you have um, you have limits, for example, in in the accuracy of the of the of, of the data that you're able to obtain, and uh, this also also you have limits in the in the accuracy of the forecast um, that that you get using the uh, weather based data so uh, just some for some parts just technological limits to um, maybe any technology okay very good um we'll probably continue as long as jason doesn't kick us off um where's one more um, sorry bill i think i think we're over time oh, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for that yeah thank no you problem. no problem thanks a million Tolu. thanks Thank you, Tulu, for the presentation. And now I would like to first introduce you Dr. Shinshin Zhao, who would give us a talk about fast frequency support from wind turbine systems by arresting frequency nadir close to settling frequency. Meanwhile, we can ask Dr. Shinshin Zhao to share her screen, please, with us. Uh, OK. If it's possible, because you have the co-host authorities you would be able to share your screen. Um, Dr. Shin Shin Zhao received her PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Birmingham in 2018. Since October 2018, she's a senior power system researcher at University College Dublin, participating in a migrate project research in which the power system consists of 100% power electronics. We are looking forward for your presentation. Uh, hello, I cannot share the screen. Uh, share the screen. Oh. Yes. Install. Uh, now we are waiting for your screen to uh, come up. And yes, we can now screen, see your oh. screen. Do you see me okay. or see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. It's perfect. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. 
My name is Xian Xian Zhao. I'm from University College Dublin, Republic of Ireland. Today I'm going to talk about fast frequency support from wind turbine systems by arresting frequency nodule close to setting frequency. The increasing wind power penetration needs to no frequency nodules. A no frequency nodule is highly undesirable as it will trick no frequency demand disconnection, which will significant which will cause significant uh, um, disruption to electricity consumers. For example, one million customers lost their power during the August 2019 in the UK due to the frequency nodule of 48.8 Hz, triggering the automatic low frequency demand disconnection. To address this problem, in fact, we can use variable speed wind turbine systems. However, the challenge is that normally wind turbine systems have no extra energy as they perform maximum power point tracking control. There are two types of methods to, for wind turbine systems to provide fast frequency response. Type one, a wind turbine system is a deloaded operation at normal state. Type two, using the large existing rotational energy in a wind turbine system to provide a faster frequency response. This work is based on the second type because it will not cause financial and efficiency losses for wind farm owners. This, uh, the, in the typical conventional faster frequency support method, the washout component or seminal components are used for wind turbine system recovery. Since the recovery needs extra energy to be absorbed from the grid, usually a frequency second dip appears. The fixed gain of the frequency support loop is not suitable for providing consistent good frequency support and the different wind speeds and the wind, power, wind power penetration levels because on the different wind speeds, a wind turbine system has different stored rotational energy and on the different wind power penetration levels, the frequency support requirements are also different. This line shows the dy frequency dynamics in a traditional power system. The dashed black line shows that the frequency nodule is lower if the wind turbine system operates at maximum power point tracking. The dashed line shows that the frequency nodule can be raised if the conventional frequency support method is used. However, we see that there is a frequency second dip. Uh, the red, red line shows the proposed solution. We can see that the frequency nodule is greatly raised close to the setting frequency, and there is no secondary frequency dip. This can be realized because there is no recovery during the primary frequency control. The recovery will automatically realized in the secondary frequency control. In this way, the frequency nodule can be, uh, can be raised to a high level because more energy can be re released. Uh, in the proposed uh, solution, 
An adaptive gain is used to ensure consistent frequency radio improvement and the variable wind speeds and the different penetration levels and the system conditions. This slide shows the details of the proposed fast frequency support control. The adaptive gain is a function of uh, the real-time rotor speed and the minimum rotor speed and the penetration level. We can, uh, using a proper function, the adaptive gain first can prevent wind turbine system over deceleration and that ensure the wind turbine system stability. Second, it can adapt to different wind speeds and the penetration levels. Third, with the data F as input, it can adapt to, to different system conditions and a continuous frequency events to 100% ensure wind turbine system stability. The real-time rotor speed is used as input to design the uh, protection logic. The two area system with an aggregated doubly fed induction generator based wind farm is simulated on real-time digital simulator to fit different wind power penetration levels, synchronous generator capacities are scaled down. This simulation shows the frequency dynamics and the different operating conditions. With uh, comparing the uh, dashed and the solid black line, we can say that if the wind turbine system operates the maximum power point tracking mode, the frequency radio is lower than the conventional power system. Comparing the blue and the black solid line, we can say that using the conventional fast frequency support, the frequency radio is raised, but we can say there are frequency oscillations and the frequency settle down takes around 50 seconds. The red line is uh, the frequency dynamics using the proposed method. We can see that the frequency nadia is uh, highly significantly raised close to the frequency, settling frequency. The shortage, we can see that the, using the proposed method, the settling frequency is lower than that uh, under the uh, maximum power point tracking control and the conventional fast frequency control. But we can say the settling frequency are very, frequencies are very close. The proposed method is uh, uh, further simulated in the IEEE 39 bus power system with uh, aggregated permanent magnetic synchronous generator based wind farms. In this system, the wind power penetration level is 70% and the wind farms have different wind speeds. The simulation results show that using the proposed method, the frequency radio is raised greatly, and the settling frequency are very close. This slide shows another simulation case settings. In this case, part of the wind farm is bus 32, is equipped with varying wind speed. The simulation result, uh, the an under frequency event is applied at 120 seconds. We can see we can we see the red line using the proposed method. The frequency nadia is raised. Also, we can see that using the proposed method, the frequency is smooth. In conclusion, the proposed fast frequency support have, has three main benefits. First, the frequency nadia is significantly raised. Second, consistent frequency nadia improvement 
and the variable wind speeds and the penetration levels are ensured. So the frequency second dip is avoided. More details, please see our published paper. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for the presentation. So can I ask Bill to lead our questions, please? Okay. Yep, perfect. Um, yeah, so far on any questions anyone has, um, Jason can stop us whenever. Um, so just a couple of questions that came in. Um, how much is the loss of wind power captured using the proposed method? Oh, so, sorry, could you repeat again? Okay. So yeah, the question is, how much is the loss of wind power capture using the proposed method? Uh, when the power capture. Um, yeah, Sorry. that's the question. No, no worries, we can move on, we can move on. And um, another question has just come in here. Um, what are the limitations from the control hardware to implementing this type of control? Are the PCB are the PCBs used in existing systems capable of implementing this adaptive control strategy? Uh, yes, uh, yes. This uh, uh, this control logic is very easy to be to be implemented. Mm. You 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 can say that we. Uh, the all the all, all the signals are already existing in the wind turbine system. Uh, we need, for example, the rotor speed. Uh, we already used in the MPPT maximum power po the existing maximum power point tracking control. Also, we needed to use the frequency as input. The frequency uh, is already existing using the PL, um, this uh, PL uh, is already used in the wind turbine system. So all, all information are, are local and uh, already existing in the existing control. So yes, it can Perfect. be. Perfect. Okay, thanks a million. I, I, I think that's all we have time for. I'm just getting a message off Jason here. So we might move on, but thanks a million for that, Jin Jin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xinxin, for your presentation. So since we are coming to the, uh, closer to the end of our event, I would like to ask our chairs to uh, uh, say a couple of sentences about the event and the future event. So can we start with you, Jason? Yeah. Um, so firstly, Mel, I'd like to say thank you very much um, to yourself. Um, the event has gone very smoothly and you're a really excellent host. So I'd just like to, I'd like to acknowledge that. Um, I'd like to just say thank you to Jinji and all the team at the UK NGN. Um, I think this has been a really excellent example of how teams can work collaboratively um, while also working remotely. Um, I think like the current COVID-19 situation has really um, asked a lot of people to step up to the plate with regards to working collaboratively and working remotely, um, virtual teams and all that. And I think as two groups come together with over, I think, I think we had 110 plus participants on the line during the call. Um, I think it's just a really excellent example of how people can come together and work together under challenging circumstances. Um, I'd like to thank the all, all the speakers, so Professor Teresi, Dr. Peter Wall, um, my colleague in ESB, uh, Tulupe Meomi, and also to Jin Jin for their excellent and insightful presentations. Um, it just goes to prove how the future of wind energy there is a lot more to it than actually simply just constructing wind turbines. Um, it's a very holistic approach and there are several stakeholders that need to be involved. So while a solution is building a wind turbine, um, there's a lot of work that goes on in the background. And I think 
our presenters today have done a really excellent example of demonstrating that to us and um, outlining all the all the, the challenges that we may face and the potential solutions to optimizing both onshore and offshore wind generation in both of our countries. Um, I just took a few notes throughout. Um, and then also, I'm not sure, if, I can't remember if I said it already, but thanks to all the committee at Seagra Ireland NGN um, and to both groups for all your work in participating and in organizing this event. So thank you very much. And thank you to all the attendees. I hope you enjoyed this session. You found it informative. And we really hope to be able to welcome you back to further webinars in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, it was my pleasure to host this event and also working with this team. So, Jingyi, would you also like to add some closing remarks? Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. And the, yeah, and the first thanks is, of course, for you to be a su super uh, woman to facilitate this event and also to chair this event. And I think we deserve some uh, remote uh, party afterwards. And I would also like to thank uh, to several of um, the UK steering committee. So uh, thanks in to uh, follow this initiation of collaboration with Ireland from the beginning. And also thanks to being the auto robot uh, on our chat box. And um, thanks Janine to be the Wikipedia for all the IT equipment. And uh, thanks, uh, thanks to Dong, our membership lead, to prepare the membership and mod mentoring slides. Also, thanks Hai Chuan, who prepared the uh, uh, survey for us, and uh, which will be sent out by Ying as well. Uh, and I hope everyone can uh, help to uh, provide your valuable response to the feedback and we, so that we can improve our webinar. And uh, last but not least, special thanks to all the members leading by Jason, the Ireland Committee. And our original plan was a site visit collaboration to Sony and Ergrade um, site. But unfortunately, uh, because of the current situation, we couldn't pay the visit. But um, uh, Ireland has prepared this uh, wind energy workshop and we kind of just jumping and start this collaboration. And we originally planned it for just a small group discussion, but now it turned out to be a open to public webinar. And um, also thanks Corner to prepare the presentation slides for all the speakers. And thanks Bill for be being the uh, Q&A chair for the session. And that's all my thanks to the people working in the background of this webinar. I will hand it back to Mel. So thank you very much for the great teamwork again. And thank you for all the participants participating in our webinar. We would love, love to hear back from you. And we will be sending in our chat box our feedback survey. Please feel free to fill it now or afterwards. Uh, and please stay, stay tuned to our future events. You can send your questions to our email addresses if we, uh, we could give you a response. And uh, in the chat box, we have shared the events at sigra.ngnuk.org uh, mail address. Um, that's all from our webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. And hope to see you in our future events as well. Goodbye, everyone.